So I think we can start. Good evening. And um, uh, I'm often Anastasakis. I'm the director of uh, Southeast European Studies at Oxford. And it is for me a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all in our first event of the calendar year 2022, which is also our 20th anniversary of Southeast European Studies at Oxford. So we are very pleased to start with um, the panel uh, today and uh, to welcome you on this first uh, event. And uh, there will be more events coming up uh, uh, throughout uh, this academic year. Now for today, we're really pleased to have this great and excellent panel to discuss what's in a name, the classical Greek and Jewish diasporas and implications for the present with uh, Robin Cohen, who will be presented later, uh, Manolis Pratsinakis and Rene Hirschen, who will be also chairing the discussion in the first part. Just for me to say that this is uh, part of our uh, CSOX diaspora project that uh, we have been um, uh, managing and working on for the last four years, looking at the case of Greece in particular and uh, the engagement between homeland and diaspora during the period of crisis. Now we are already, of course, in the second phase of it, looking at the post-crisis uh, period, but we are also very much into comparisons as well. And uh, that is uh, such an important comparison that we are looking at today. And uh, before I hand over to my great, wonderful colleague, Rene Hirschen, just to say that it is a pleasure to have Rene chair this. We all of us know Rene Hirschen uh, from her own work, uh, and in particular, her work on the Asia Minor disaster and the refugees coming to Greece, uh, where she's dedicated her life on, the, on this topic. Rene is um, a member of our steering committee at uh, CSOX. Uh, she is also a senior research fellow at St. Peter's College. And uh, her book, Crossing the Aegean, is actually um, having its, rather, Hairs of the Greek Catastrophe is having its um, edition, as well as uh, Crossing the Aegean, which are the books that I've been referring to uh, earlier. So with that, over to you, Rene, to introduce uh, the speakers and then engage in the conversation with them. And just to say that because um, I will be monitoring the second part of the discussion, um, I would like to ask you to put your question if you want, or to put your, uh, to indicate that you would like to ask the question yourself, because then we will be asking uh, Ladislav Charus that you cannot see, but he's helping us with the logistics together with Julie Adams to allow you to speak. With that, over to you, Rene. Thank you very much, Othon. Um, I'm obviously greatly honored to be asked to be the chair of this panel. And um, <clears throat> I really want to start off with a, a, an aside, which is basically a personal introduction. Because when I was asked to chair this session, I was rather reluctant, saying that I was not actually qualified in this particularly niche study of diasporas. However, some people insisted saying that they felt I was uniquely qualified to do so. And this arises out of my own personal life story. So most of you will know me as Renee Hirschman, but I do have another persona. In a different context, I am known as Rena Filipaiki. I'm actually a member of both the Jewish and the Greek diasporas separately. So maybe I am qualified, but I have a slightly different view on the thing to the one which we're going to hear about today. And I think we're going to have an exposure to a very broad approach because of our, the speakers who we have here who are excellent. So <clears throat> let me introduce, first of all, Robin Cohen, who is Emeritus Professor of Development Studies and a Senior Research Fellow at Kellogg College 
University of Oxford. He has written widely on migration, diasporas, creolization, and globalization. He is author of Global Diasporas and Introduction, which is the standard text on this thing, and has revised um, edition of this book, which will come out on the 25th anniversary of it in June, 2022. This seminar arises partly from the controversies generated by earlier editions of this book, which he says has been cited 8,000 times. So that is what we are dealing with in terms of expertise. And um, certainly he's going to make some very important comments about the title of the seminar. Uh, on my left is Manolis Pratsinaikis, who is a departmental lecturer in migration studies and the Onassis Fellow at the School of Anthropology, University of Oxford. He is also the deputy project man manager of the CSOPS Diaspora Project. Manolis has written on diasporas, ethnic boundaries, and categorization, everyday nationalism, and intra-EU mobility. So to start off, I think we should, I should just mention that the title in itself, What's in a Name, provides us with a lead into the discussion to follow. And I think we should be very cognizant of the fact that names are significant. They should not be taken for granted and they need investigation. And so I think I will turn over to our speakers now to discuss, among other things, the word diaspora and its implications. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Renee. Thank you, uh, Orton and Manola, for in inviting, inviting me here. I want to just put a couple of slides up as we go. So, to so start um, it, with the first slide, um, this really just frames the period that we're talking about, at least initially, um, namely the period of classical um, civilization in Greece and Rome, known as the classical world from uh, the 8th century BCE to the 6th century CE. And within that, um, I wanted to point to three or four crucial events. The first is the destruction of the Temple of Solomon by the Babylonian Empire uh, in 587-586 um, BCE. Um, and that was the moment at which um, a significant section of the ancient Judean population um, was, um, uh, was dragged off to Babylon. And it created the myth, the history, the ideology, the framing of the idea of a Jewish diaspora. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. The second significant date, um, 332 BCE, was the founding of Alexandria by Alexander the Great. Um, and then the third century again BCE was when the translation of the Hebrew Bible, Septuagint, uh, was translated into Greek. And interestingly enough, this translation was commissioned by Hellenist Jews who lived in Alexander at the time. So they were asking that this um, Bible for originally composed in ancient Hebrew or Aramaic, be translated into the vernacular of the time. And then finally, the translation of the New Testament um, in, a little, in later on from uh, 50 common era to 100 common era. Now, the point about mentioning those translations is that in the first instance, the word diaspora was used um, 13 times, in the second it was used six times, and the word diaspora was, of course, a Greek word, Greek um, roots, 
and loosely translated is to sow or to sow over or to disperse. And some uh, scholars have analogized it to a farmer uh, throwing seed across uh, a field. So that's the kind of implication. One important scholar, Stefan Dubois, argues that this word was a neologism. In other words, it was used for the first time, it was invented for the purpose of translating the Hebrew Bible. Okay. That is open to dispute, as we'll see. But that is the assertion made by one very important scholar. So if we flip to the next slide, and we can go through these relatively quickly here. This one uh, is the uh, map of Greek colonies in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. And I went only to point you uh, to Noah Curtis, which is um, the bit very close to about 70 kilometers from uh, Alexandria, which I've mentioned a few minutes ago and had already been settled by the Greeks uh, earlier on. Now that will come, Manoni will come back to that slide a little later on. So if we could flip to the next one, which is the Jewish uh, settlements around this area, you'll see that they map onto each other quite closely, not um, extending around the Black Sea at this time, although there were some settlements there, but mapping onto the Greek ones in rather similar sort of way. So there's a considerable overlap between these two ancient. So if we go on to, the, uh, we've lost the next slide, but if we could find it soon, it will come, come up in, in a minute or two. And basically the argument that uh, we all uh, now are trying to address uh, arises from the fact that when I first put this book out 25 years ago, I innocently cited the work of a scholar who had written the entry to the first Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences in 1931, who asserted, um, I think in the opening sentence, that in a sense, diaspora could be used to describe um, settlements, dispersed settlements, including those settlements of the Greeks um, in the uh, area of the Mediterranean, he was alluding particularly to the ancient Roman settlements in southern Sicily. So I cited this only to find that I was assaulted on a number of uh, um, occasions. Uh, a kind of footnote war ensued um, with one scholar, Martin Bauman, suggesting, for example, that in an otherwise commendable book, this error had been made several times by me. I was precisely somebody else in innocence. <laughs> but the error was, as far as he was concerned, that it would be totally inappropriate to use the word diaspora of the ancient Greek settlements. And that was reinforced later on in a very important work by Stephen Dufois, who wrote a history of the word diaspora in 600 pages. Okay, so it's a pretty heavy duty affair in which he asserted, as I indicated earlier, that it was a neologism, that it was then therefore inappropriate to use this word um, because it hadn't yet been invented. So how could there be a Greek diaspora when there wasn't such a word to describe it? As it turns out, when I referred this controversy to my great friend, Nolo, he produced uh, a citation from Thucydides 100 years earlier. So it wasn't actually in the list, despite the authority of the of Stefan mm -hmm. Dufour, who incidentally is a friend and a great scholar. So I don't want to be at all um, uh, dismissive of what his arguments were. But you can see now we're at the point of saying what's in a name? Is it important to understand the Greek and Jewish? dispersions, I'll use that word neutrally for a moment, as similar or different. And it's, I think my starting point, and this is where I, I, I depart from much scholarship on this theme, is that I think the Jewish 
diaspora is itself mischaracterized. And it's mischaracterized because every definition centers on the destruction of the Temple of Solomon and the dragging off of people to Babylon, where it is said they had a terrible hard, a terribly hard time. And in particular, if you consult Deuteronomy 28, you will notice amongst many other um, comments, if you do not observe and fulfill the law, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of to the earth to the other. That was the idea. You will have a lonely time, you will have a miserable time, you will be um, sad, lonely, you will sweep by the rivers of Babylon. Okay. Now, first of all, the problem with this is unless you're the biblical literalist and believe that this is literally the word of God, you can probably, from the point of view of a secular social scientist, say, well, these are priests warning of consequences if they don't fulfill the law, so they want to try and gather people together into one set of religious observances. So it is functional, it is a power play. It is not true that, the, despite some popular mischaracterization, that the whole of uh, the Jewish population were taken off to Babylon, a very significant section was, perhaps about 25%, but 75% remained in Judea, and they had, as we saw from our map, dispersed to all sorts of other parts of the world, including um, Alexandria, where there was a thriving Jewish population at the time that Alexander the Great founded the city, uh, they constituted some 35% of the population. Were philosophers, sages, teachers. It was later on in the Roman period, uh, somebody became a, a general from the Jewish population. Uh, the famous philosopher Philo was Jewish, Hellenistic Jewish, and of course, they, they were sufficiently prosperous to commission the translation of the Bible. So, in other words, the Jewish diaspora comprised both voluntarist and involuntary migration. They were both dragged off and they voluntarily dispersed. So if you understand the Jewish diaspora in that more, in that more mixed sense with mixed motivations and mixed characterizations, you will begin to see that the Greek diaspora resembles it to some degree. And to a considerable degree, and I'll leave some of that to an honest comment. But I want to conclude by turning to a something like a more philosophical argument, and it turns again on this phrase of what's in a name, and in particular, can you use the expressions retrospectively, uh, anachronistically, if you want to use it? So we, for example, use the word Greek civilization of ancient Greece, and we will. If you Google it, find over a million hits, but the word civilization wasn't really invented until the 1750s. So why are we now using that retrospective? Because it seems to fit. And so on that argument, you could use, even if the word diaspora, Greek as it was, was not used of the Greek settlements at large, where can one use it, I'll pose it as a question rather than authority? say it can or can't, uh, can one use it retrospectively? So I'm going to leave it at that and turn now to my colleagues. Thank you very much, Rodan. Just as stimulating as I anticipated, uh, and there'll be lots of time for discussion. So my lawyer would like to respond first of all. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Rene. Uh, it's Great pleasure and an honor to me uh, to be sharing the panel with you, Rene Kitson and uh, Robin Cohen. Slightly daunting, as is the expectation that I will speak about classical Greece. Uh, I'm not a historian, let alone a classicist, so I claim no expertise in that era. What I'll try to do, following the lead uh, of um, Robin, is to try and explore the extent to which present day concepts are helpful in assessing experiences of the past 
and vice versa, the different uh, legacies, representations, constructions that emerge from the reading of the past to this concept and how it informs uh, our understanding of the present, if I may say. And I would like to start by the famous book by Xenophon, Anabasis. Uh, in which he narrates uh, the expedition of the Greek, uh, of a large Greek uh, mercenary uh, army, which was hired by Cyrus in his aim to dethrone um, uh, his brother, Artaxerxes, and uh, become the king of uh, Persia. That happened in uh, 400 BC. Uh, Cyrus himself was killed, in fact, in the battle, which made the actions uh, of the Greek uh, troops irrelevant. So the book actually uh, describes uh, the efforts of the mercenaries to reach Greece from Mesopotamia, where they were stranded within uh, enemy uh, uh, territory without supplies. And, you know, there starts a long journey that lasted several months until they eventually reached the Black Sea. So when they did, they famously, in relief and joy, shouted, Falata, Falata, uh, meaning the sea, the sea. And their enthusiasm obviously related to the fact that they expected through the sea they will eventually reach their home. But also it meant that after several months wandering in enemy territory, they will most probably have arrived in friendly territory. And they were right in this assumption because in the place where you know, they reached the sea was uh, Trebizond. So if we see the map uh, uh, in the very in the kind of the uh, eastern, uh, southern coast of Black Sea, uh, there's a settlement called um, Trebizond. It was a Hellenistic settlement, which was uh, essentially Greek. Um, so the, the sea somehow in the classical period <clears throat> connotated Greekness, one may say, because the, the Greek world somehow stretched around the coastal areas of Mediterranean and Black Sea. And that was the result of a process we today conventionally um, name as colonization. And I will turn to if you know that's a right term to use. Um, so those uh, settlements emerged by migrants uh, from those from several city states in mainland Greece or the Ionian coastline. Um, who uh, settled in what they considered to be free land, establishing new uh, settlements, which emerged as new city states. Uh, they had some, uh, they kept uh, a mutual beneficial relationship with their mother uh, city state, so to say. And so when they left, they would uh, have a oath not to harm uh, each other. The process itself started, um, we can like now leave the slides in the notes functional to what I'm saying from here onwards. So uh, the process itself started from the 11th century, uh, initially concerning uh, uh, the settlements in the Aegean Islands and the Western Anatolia coast, the Ionian uh, coast. Um, and the process that concerns us mostly uh, today uh, took place during the 8th century uh, until the 6th century. <clears throat> the main concentrations were in South Italy and Sicily, which came to be known as Magna Grecia at one point. And that was not only because of the size of the settlements that uh, flourished there, but also because some of them outgrew uh, in uh, wealth and display their uh, mother uh, cities. Um, it was also another uh, um, big concentration was in Black Sea where uh, Xenophon and uh, his troop found refuge and eventually organized their return to Greece. So why were those settlements emerged? Trade and developing markets was uh, important, uh, a reason for certain states to dispatch a, a number of pioneers to uh, establish such um, outposts, emporium, uh, as they were called. And similarly important was the fluctuation of resources and you know, which led to lack of food at different points, which again uh, led to uh, new settlements. Uh, one theory that is less popular today is overpopulation. Apparently, the areas from which uh, there is the largest number of uh, people living in, uh, and uh, developing those settlements didn't have issues of uh, uh, overpopulation, such as Halkis, Corinth, Ebia, uh, Megara, and so forth. The written sources from historians like Herodotus, Thucydides, the geographer Strabo, from whom we get 
information about them do not provide uh, much information about the motivations uh, behind the reasons for this uh, you know, expansion of the Greek world outside mainland Greece. Uh, when they do, they highlight forced immigration and conflict. And indeed, it appears that those were major reasons, uh, if not the most important in significance. And here we see a commonality in the mixedness of uh, motivations. Uh, the aim was not to dominate and exploit uh, local populations. Uh, in some cases, they were invited by local authorities. Uh, sometimes land was given to them in some kind of an exchange with which they engaged with local tribal ruler. In other cases, they uh, um, settled in area which they thought or they claimed is free, but that was not the opinion of the people who were living no next by. So there was conflict indeed. In other cases, Greeks and locals lived alongside each other. Uh, there was exchange interaction, um, and locals were influenced by Greece and vice versa. The Greek settlers, settlers uh, adopted uh, local part practices and adapted it. So there was fusion, uh, so to say. In total, there were something like uh, 280 uh, such colonies. Uh, and from the point where they had started like uh, existing as such, they gave the option of um, travel uh, within this interconnected Greek world uh, to many people, either because of choice or uh, in case they were forced. So Garland, uh, in his book, Wandering Greeks, uh, identifies six types of migrant, the deportee, the evacuee, uh, the asylum seeker, the fugitive, the economic migrant, and the itinerant. So uh, different motivations. And he provides ample evidence in his book that being a Greek at that period meant facing the prospect of being displayed at, displaced at one point of uh, your life. Um, now, several articles that uh, this process, as I mentioned, it was named as colonization. Again, a term that uh, didn't exist as such uh, back then. And is a modern anglophone concept um, uh, with reference to uh, the imperial expansion of uh, Europe. Uh, and Recently, there is some uh, debate that um, it is a concept that it is transported back and forced onto uh, ancient Greece and not uh, you know, the most appropriate term. And as I mentioned, indeed, uh, or in fact, this I've, uh, I should have uh, stressed, they, those uh, sentiments were not always state organized, but in many cases, they emerged out of a private initiative. Uh, of groups and individuals. So it was not a state organized uh, endeavor, so to say, at least not in all cases. And there was not the attempt to exploit lo local uh, population. They were not the result of war, not in most cases. So we see some you know, issues that you know, uh, make us problematize the, uh, the extent to which the word colonization may be out. And how about diaspora? As uh, Robin uh, suggested before me, uh, initially there was this idea that you know a diaspora may be a new uh, logism uh, uh, used in the trans uh, invented the translation of the Bible and the New Testament. Uh, other sources uh, point to us, however, that Thucydides, Thucydides has used the term and used it in order to describe uh, in, in his book about the Peloponnesian War. Uh, to describe the destruction of Aegina, the island Aegina, and the banishment of the local population. So it was about the actual act of dispersion. It didn't refer to population as such. So it, indeed, it wasn't used with the current, um, in the current way we use the term. But I, in agreement here with, uh, with, uh, with Robin and us, we were thinking about that. If we take into account uh, a current understanding um, of diaspora, uh, which departs from uh, a strict conceptualization of the world that links it to the Jewish history and a certain version of the Jewish history, as Robin suggested, because the reality of the Jewish diaspora was much more uh, diverse, even uh, in, in those uh, times that we're speaking uh, about. Uh, and then we think of diaspora as um, any population that exhibits to a certain extent at least uh, those three minimal criteria, which is dispersion, uh, having a separate identity, and keeping some connection, having some orientation towards the homeland. How do this apply to, to uh, the classical 
Greek uh, dispersion. Obviously, you had dispersion. Greeks did kept to uh, like their their identity. I should say better. They had a sense of differentiating from uh, the other populations that they were around them. So there was a kind of a boundary maintenance and an identification as Greeks. In terms of homeland, there was this connection, as I, as I mentioned, uh, but it was not with a conception of Greece. Uh, it was in a period where we had like a central state. There were nation states as such. But the connection was with a particular city state from which they uh, originated. So in a way, we can say uh, that there was a kind of a diaspora, but not exactly like the one we have today, more of a transnational network, a polycentric diaspora, as we say, because there were several centers. There was not one core homeland. Uh, maybe there was an idea of uh, all being Greek, which um, was mobilized or was embraced only when you know, uh, wider Greek populations uh, faced threats from, from outside uh, enemies. And I think I should leave it here. Um, and you know, maybe we can get into the quick Q and A in the more qualification of those, mm -hmm. those issues. Thank you very much indeed. I think there's a lot of interesting points that um, could be discussed between the two panelists here. Um, and one of them that strikes me is the question of the anachronistic use of the term. Um, and that's been a problem for historians, I think, with regard to, for example, the term genocide, which was to be avoided in the case of the Armenians, because a, a very strong Jewish lobby said that that was a term that only related to the experience of the Holocaust. And so I think there's a bit of a debate that we could do about this, whether is the Greek experience constitutes colonization or not. Um, and again, you know, are we projecting into the past an idea that is not uh, irrelevant to the times? And I think your point, Manoli, about um, the notion of homeland, very important to revise our idea about what constituted the point of origin that these people who were living elsewhere, they didn't see a state called Greece, it was their their local communities, basically. So I think that's a question of scale and, you know, what the, um, and it raises a more general issue that I, I'm very interested in is, can you have the notion of a diaspora without a geographical entity? Because there are, I think, in the um, internet world of today, there are groups who claim to be diasporic because they're scattered across the globe. And they don't have any particular geographical origin, but they have an interest in common, and therefore are diasporic. So I'd like to know if, you know, if you're going to be dealing with that in your 25th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed I do, but let, let, let me just uh, pick up some of these points and um, make um, some comments, not completely covering every one. I think this point about not connecting with a definite place, a definite homeland, um, is also true of the Jewish diaspora at that time. And indeed, just by irony, the philosopher who I alluded to, who was Jewish and Hellenistic, he spoke Greek, he said to have invented the word metropolis or metropolis, mm -hmm. and he analogized it. Um, precisely as we are suggesting, by suggest saying, well, as Athens is to some of the polai, the traveling polai outside, so Jerusalem is to the Jews in the, around Alexandria and so on. So they related to a place, very often a smaller place, than something like even ancient Judea, which was even too big, uh, just as Greek, Greece was this cluster of honor. Uh, so I think there's, there's common ground, and I think that's um, very, very helpful. Uh, on the issue of um, genocide, I mean, this is an aside in a way, but seeing that you, you raised it, I think it is important to 
get into that discussion that Philippe Sands has where the, on the origin of the word genocide, which is, um, you know, slightly a bypasses the Jewish discussion of Holocaust. But it is interesting that the word genocide has been fought over exactly in the way that you describe with the Armenians asserting that what happened to them, particularly after the First World War, was indeed a genocide, and the Turks denying it. And this has been a battle of uh, semantics ever since. And as of last week, 52 countries now accept that this was a genocide. So this, if you like, the Armenians are winning semantic battle. And as I think we've been implying all along, it's not just what's in the name, but there's a war of words. We have the word words signify and carry lots of deep mm -hmm. meanings. And I think mean, Rene started us off in that way by saying, you know, words matter. And what I'm suggesting in the case of the diaspora is that words the word matters in the sense that we mustn't allow it to be frozen by one particular interpretation of one particular part of the Jewish um, experience, historical experience. And this comes down to your final point, uh, uh, can we widen it to the extent of saying we can actually abolish homeland? And I think this is where, if you like, the edges of the word um, begin to slightly get wobbly because you could argue there needs to be some concept of home, even if not homeland. Um, for example, you might say of um, the Muslim diaspora, which has been especially very widely used, that you can think not of Saudi Arabia as a homeland, but of the religious um, in shrines and objects and so on, Mecca, Medina, and the Black Rock, and so on, as forms of home, of symbolic homes. Uh, the Hindu diaspora might focus on the Ganges and so on. So you might be able to construct diasporas. But I, what I would suggest is, although you might have a very loose idea of home, it's probably right that one clings onto some sort of symbolic center when you use the expression mm -hmm. diaspora, because diaspora meaning dispersion means imply dispersed for what reason from where. You know, it, it's, it's an awkward, um, word if you let it go that far. That's just my view. Did you want to respond to that? Uh, yes, maybe. Um, I would add uh, that the idea that we have today of homeland when we refer to contemporary diasporas is uh, more often than not linked to a nation state. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a you know, a very particular type of homeland that may resonate or may not resonate to people who, you know, uh, feel attachment to a place they call home. And, uh, you know, the issue of anachronism that you uh, raised and I asked us to uh, uh, comment upon, I think comes uh, here as a relevant issue because uh, exactly because of the centrality of uh, homeland as, as a country, as a nation state, that we have in present understandings of, of this word become then the word diaspora becomes problematic when we think of it uh, in the past because you know such entities didn't exist as such. But I guess it was a sense of like a, a place, um, uh, and at the same time maybe a, a wider um, feeling of a collective belonging to some some uh, social group. Um, you know loosely defined as an ethnic group, let's say, which may be transterritorial or located more or less in a certain, in a certain uh, place. And I think if we have such kind of an understanding which goes beyond the homeland strictly referring to a nation state, then uh, we can think of the concept as a useful concept to understand um, uh, processes of, of the past. And in terms of like the war of wars, uh, words uh, that um, Europe referred to, um, and linking this up to the current like problematization of the world uh, colonization as an upward to describe 
what was happening uh, in Greece. I think that has to do with what significations the words get in different historical points. So uh, several decades earlier, I mean, uh, colonization didn't have uh, the, the, the meanings that we attribute to it uh, today because of the mobilization of the writings of uh, people engaging in uh, anti-colonial struggle and post-colonial writers. So the term has now this negative meaning that it has, um, as it should. And thus, you know, that prompted some people to not want to, you know, have this, you know, negative connotation of uh, the term spill over uh, on, you know, this Greek kind of uh, legacy and made them want to dissociate and not use. So the words themselves change and get different significations. And then, so it's a constant process uh, of like thinking which words may be useful or not in relation to how we think of the present and the values that we attribute to, to words. Right. Well, I mean, it strikes me that we, we are as a group here on, in the discussion, nuancing with considerable skill, some categories that are easy to take for granted. And I think you're, you, I picked up one term you used, polycentric networks, which is an interesting way of putting out kind of situational approach to the joining up of people who are not on their own ground or even symbolically. Um, and, and talking about dispersion rather than diaspora, mm -hmm. there's a kind of concretization, I think, about using a term like that. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether, um, Robin, because I don't know what you're writing in your revised, about the typologies that you brought up that were very useful. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, you're taking me to a slightly different field, but I thank you very much for, for raising this. I mean, I produced this. A fivefold typology in my revised edition. I have the sixth typology, and of course, this is something that um, younger scholars often get really rather angry about because they see typologies as a positivist um, trick, as a way in which um, uh, social construction is is sidelined, some sort of thing, which many younger scholars are, are quite are quite ready to. Um, for me, a typology is uh, much more open-ended. It's much more complex. I tend to be a barbarian typologist than, uh, in, than some, you know, in which the ideal type is very far removed from the, the real type. But um, equally, uh, I think the reason for a typology is important, not a typology in itself. And that does allow comparison. And that is the crucial thing. And this is what we're doing in effect today. Is we're saying, how do the Greek and ancient Greek and ancient Jewish diasporas compare? And you really do need typology. You need the word, of course, but you also need to find some of the basic features which we talked in terms of you know, voluntary versus involuntary, state involvement, not state involvement, the whole idea of uh, a, a, a sort of sense of uh, an ethnic group or a difference from local people, the connection to home, if not homeland, and so on. Uh, so I, I, I think typologies are a significant and important method of studying diaspora. Well, I just wanted to raise this sort of to a different level of categorization. Yeah. And how do you see, both of you, Diaspora studies in terms of the field called migration studies. Okay, well, Manolo, do you want to have a go at that? Maybe I should also say that there's a question about transnationalism, mm. you know, as part of the approach that is a different level of generalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in a way, I would see diaspora studies as a subfield of migration studies. Or to a certain extent, even though it does cover populations, uh, because it's a it's a concept that points towards phenomena of the long duration. So it can be like descendants of several several generations of migrants. So maybe it's, it's in a way also a different field at the same time. But generally, I tend to think of it as a kind of a, a lens through which you can approach migration. Uh, usually, we speak about 
migrants, minorities, uh, ethnic groups, and those are terms uh, that have negative connotation, whereas in contrast to that, diasporas, the notion of diaspora is a much more positive term, and it is one that can be and has been picked up by people uh, to self-identify and describe their collectivities in a more positive light. So in that sense, I find it uh, interesting and useful, but also as, as a lens, and also as a as a pointing to a concrete issue, phenomenal, uh, um, to which we owe collectively a lot to Robin and his seminal book by, you know, um, highlighting, you know, uh, you know, uh, global diasporas as, as actually existing uh, collectivities and communities. Um, and in terms of the relationship of the term with transnationalism, um, yeah, I would say that, yeah, it is a subfield of, you know, the study of transnationalism and, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an ethnic transnational community, that's what diaspora site I how I think them about, it. whereas you can have all kinds of transnational communities that are not diasporic necessarily. You can have like religious transnational uh, networks, you can have like uh, professional uh, business that are organized in a transnational manner and they kind of connect and have those networks. But if you speak about an ethnic collectivity that uh, has a kind of a transnational articulation, that's how I would say the two uh, links. Yes, I, mean, I concur. I don't think I want to add anything of any significance. I do see diaspora studies as nesting within my migration studies. And uh, I mean, there's a, a clear and vivid difference between, let us say, an individual migrant going to country X, uh, changing their name, adopting a new citizenship, and um, speaking the language of their country of settlement, and abandoning any ethnic connection with the prior. The diaspora does point to this continuity um, over several generations, and equally important, the close solidarity with other communities that have dispersed to other places. So I think that's an important part of the diaspora: is that you know there's not there's this historical continuity, there's a connection with home, and there is that that network effect of other communities and feeling engaged and involved with similar communities elsewhere. Mm. Well, thank you very much. I think that's um, time for us to pass on to the second section of this meeting, which is the Q&A. And I need to call on Othon. Thank There's you a... very much, René. This is indeed a fascinating discussion. The format is also wonderful. I would like to apologize a little bit for the that the sound might not be as ideal as we would have liked. So I would like to ask you again to speak a little bit more clearly but it's been fascinating to see all three of you discussing that. And um, I am seeing a que a one question that has been coming. Before we go to uh, Robin though, with his question, I would like to ask from my um, uh, side, um, uh, two questions. The first one, um, Robin, why do you think that, um, you know, some countries, especially in the West, do not like to use the word diaspora? They prefer to use the term expats. Is diaspora a derogatory term? Is it only related uh, to the African continent, for instance, or the historical diasporas, Jews, Armenians, and Greeks? That's my first question. And I've got one more. Um, there is, um, since part of our discussion is also the connection with the present, my sense is that with the Jewish diaspora, we are seeing some kind of a linearity um, and how this has been going through time. With the Greek diaspora, it's a bit different. When we speak of Greek diaspora, we're actually thinking on, of the creation of the uh, Greek modern nation state as the starting point. And then we are thinking, when we're thinking of the linearity of the Greeks actually, we're very much placing this into the context of ancient Greece, jumping to the Byzantine, then downsizing the Ottoman part and then going into the modern kind of, um, uh, maybe Manolis, you could you know, address that uh, uh, for me, please. 
Okay, I think I'm prompted first. So the word diaspora, I thought I would just have a quick look this morning when I was checking my notes. It's now on Google used two trillion times. So when you think it started off using used just 13 times, 2,300 years ago, it really has taken off. So it's a very popular word. And I think it does extend um, to populations that have um, decided it's a very positive word. So on the whole, it's going in the positive direction rather than in the negative direction. People want to be a diaspora. They think it affirms them in some important kind of way. So that's the first point. But you say not everybody likes the word diaspora. And that's absolutely true. And there's been a rather agonized conversation. I just want to allude to this, uh, if I may, um, to the, uh, the Palestinian quote unquote diaspora which at first the great Palestinian theorist and social theorist, Edward Said, really disliked. He said, no, that's the kind of Jewish thing. We don't want to be uh, thought of as a diaspora. And contemporary Palestinian decision, uh, discussion, and indeed Said in his uh, later stage, I think just uh, before he died, um, actually changed his mind and said, it's precisely because we want to refer to the Jewish diaspora to the victim part of the Jewish diaspora, that kind of logic, that we can appropriate it because we have become victims of another victim diaspora. So it created a new kind of potency. So I do think when you turn to the word expatriate, it doesn't carry that degree of potency because we, the three of us have really been talking about how words are loaded with all kinds of um, emotional um, meanings that derive from their history and from their content and from their reference and so on. And I think the, the word expatriate doesn't really carry that. So uh, I can see there's a useful discussion to be had as to why expatriate and not diaspora, but that would be my general argument. Um, if I will try to answer the, the second question about uh, the comparison between the Jewish and uh, the Greek uh, diasporas. If we zoom out and take you know a long, uh, um, long durée perspective, I would agree uh, often with what you said, and I think that's a big difference between the two diasporas. If, by calling them diasporas, in fact, at least for the Greek case, we assign to them a kind of a historical continuity that doesn't exist as such, uh, effectively. Uh, the dispersed uh, Greek world, uh, world I described expanded further, uh, as we know, during the uh, Hellenistic period, this time through war, um, and became dominant in the Mediterranean, but also in Central Asia and further ahead. But, and, you know, I became the backdrop or the cultural backdrop of the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, uh, uh, in which like the Greek was uh, the main uh, language. Uh, and then somehow the Greek language and culture um, informed uh, Roman identities. And through assimilation to the populations in Western Europe or far away in Central uh, 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 Asia, uh, lost their kind of distinct um, Hellenic or Greek uh, character. So I would say that this was a diaspora that eventually um, uh, disappeared as such. And then we have the second Greek diaspora emerging from those um, uh, people uh, belonging to the uh, Roman milieu in, in the Ottoman Empire. The, the Ottoman Empire was politically organized around self governed uh, religious communities. And one of those was uh, the Rumye, which was a successor of the, the Byzantine, uh, let's say, uh, the Orthodox Christians, and a successor of the, um, the Byzantine identities. And those people were still uh, thinking of themselves as uh, Roman. Now, in the period of uh, uh, emerging national movements, and I have to say that these uh, uh, people belonging to that Mille have been especially those speaking Greek quite dispersed again, or they redispersed themselves because of trade. 
uh, and the reasons are quite complex, but that was a reality. And some of those people reimagining themselves as Greek and being found all over the globe, you know, that kind of made them a second uh, Greek diaspora, which is unrelated from the first one in terms of like direct historical continuity. The continuity exists to the extent that these people claim a similar identity as Greeks and they happen to be dispersed, which again, this disappeared as such our, um, slowly and after the Greek state emerged because of return, forced or voluntary or because of assimilation in the places where they live. And then we have a third modern diaspora to which you refer to uh, often, which is people living from what now um, exists as um, uh, the modern Greek uh, nation state in three uh, effectively uh, mass out migration uh, waves. Um, you know, to the United States in the late eight, uh, 20th century, in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, then uh, during the post war period, post war two period, uh, mostly in, in northern and western Europe as part of the so called guest workers programs, but also in, uh, in Australia, and more recently, uh, the emigration of people uh, leaving from crisis driven Greece. So I would say that that's a difference indeed, in the sense that the Greek diaspora can be thought of not necessarily as a, shouldn't be seen as a kind of um, a historical continuity, but there are different diasporas in time that claim this Greekness and uh, asked and claim to be, you know, uh, described as as um, as Greek. So three separate, uh, whereas I think like the Jewish, uh, uh, there is some, there is much more continuity with the Jewish case, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, well, I mean, that, uh, I don't think we were able to find that slide. It's the, the last one where we compare Greek and Jewish diasporas in the contemporary period. And uh, I think it might be worth just looking at that for a moment because mm -hmm. uh, there is obviously a, a higher degree of continuity, but we should not um, uh, overestimate that. And there is an argument now, it's a rather adventurous argument, I would say, that we're coming to the end of the Jewish diaspora. It's an adventurous argument in this sense, that if you remember that quote from Deuteronomy, that you will be dispersed all over the earth. If you look at that table there, you'll notice that with uh, the growth of Israel, um, that's to say 1900, you'll see 47,000 people, and now there are nearly 7 million people in Israel. The other big concentration is about seven, six, six million in the Americans. And the smaller Jewish communities in Africa, Oceania, in South America, in, in Africa, are actually beginning to shrink and in many cases disappear. So in a sense, um, all diasporas and Jewish and Greek have to be seen um, in a complex way because they are moving all the time. Um, they are shrinking, they are growing. Um, and of course, in the case of the Jewish diaspora, we're not really at the point uh, of recovering the total population, you know, given that you know, the Holocaust knocked out about 6 million of that European group. Um, the um, European uh, community has shrunk, and shrunk uh, considerably. So I think the long durée is an important part of this discussion. Obviously, we can't go into it in any great detail because we have focused on the classical period. Mm -hmm. But I would also point to quite serious interruptions mm -hmm. and uh, displacements, remigrations, and so on. And the contemporary period are exhibiting, I think, some very unusual characteristics. Are really two clusters: Israel and the United States, and the rest is barely worth talking about numerically. It seems that uh, there's an important point to underline here whether or not it's classical period or not, which is fluctuations in assimilation and in dispersion. So I think, yeah. you know, it's illustrated as well with that slide, but I think it's been identifiable in the past as well. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I see now um, uh, Robin uh, McConaughey, uh, can you, Ladislav, could you allow Robin to ask his question by himself, please? Robin McConaughey. 
Um, can you hear me? Yes, Robin, we can hear you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Othon, and, and thank you indeed to the panel for a fascinating discussion, um, particularly on the taxonomy question, if I can call it that. I'd love to pursue some of these points because, of course, Jewish diaspora, Greek diaspora are only two of the many that there have been. But taking us to the present day, but also comparisons with history, what I'm often struck by is that migrants, to use a neutral word, whether they've been forcibly chucked out or are in search of better life, economic opportunity, they tend to do rather better. And I think there is historical evidence for that, even going back to the Greek colonies in Sicily and Italy and elsewhere. I'm interested in whether, in your experience, this is in general true. Um, and what is it that drives people to succeed? Uh, there are many theories, but I'd love to know what the panel thinks. Thank you, Robin. Um, Sorry, would you like to respond, please? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. I wasn't sure whether you were queuing me in. Um, yes, I mean, this is, as you say, it's a subject of, a, of really considerable sociological interest. And um, I would start by just a small qualification, which is to say the successful migrants uh, tend to advertise their success rather. And they do tend to say, you know, I've come from rags to riches. And the people who went from riches to rags don't get their voices as strongly heard. But nonetheless, the generalization that Robin and Adela uh, advanced is, I think, true statistically. Um, and there are a number of sociological theories that are advanced to for this. One is that, um, you know, you, 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 the people who move very often are the people who are more adventurous or have greater levels of cultural or social capital to start with. So they have, if you like, an inbuilt advantage. When they get to the other end, they also have another advantage, which is to say they have a cultural experience, often a language, um, that the local people do not have. And they may also have trade networks, when we're talking about trade diaspora, which would give them advantage in terms of sourcing goods. The final advantage, which I think a lot of people have put a lot more emphasis on um, recently, is the way in which social networks cohere to advance loans for more impoverished members of diasporas. So rather than having to rely on commercial banks and um, entering the, um, the entrepreneurial world, um, it, it, uh, through uh, normal market processes, they in a sense rely on ethnic solidarity to hold their uh, community together. They buy goods from each other, they advance loans to each other, and they secure mortgages and other kinds of advances. So there are a number of explanations, sociological, economic, cultural, that explain this. But uh, I, and I do think it's a very important thing. And, uh, well, well worth uh, you know emphasizing, but one must be careful not to assume it always works in all contexts, and also be careful not to allow the louder voices of success to drown out the quieter voices of failure. Manoli, do you want to come in, uh, or Rene, or shall we go to the? Next I, I don't want anything because that was nuanced and answered from all angles, so I don't have to answer, uh, add anything to that. Okay, um, I see uh, next uh, our very own uh, Fotini Kaladzi, who is uh, also uh, a core uh, uh, member of our Greek uh, Diaspora project. Fotini, um, I will ask Ladislav to allow you to ask the question yourself. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Okay, you might hear the baby as well. So that's why I, I wrote my question in many, I have my newborn baby in my arms. So um, that was I excellent. Like ask, well done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I would like to ask uh, whether, because we just brought our uh, book out uh, about uh, crisis and diasporas, I would like to ask you, since we have, uh, you know, um, this great panelist there with so, so much experience, what do you think that crisis uh, in general throughout history, and if you have any major examples of Jewish and Greek diasporas, what do you think crisis, what, what is the effect on, on diasporas and their unity basically, and also on homelands? Um, would, you, would you bring a, an example of a, a major crisis that altered uh, the unity of uh, um, uh, Jewish diaspora, for example, in, uh, and yeah, uh, I don't know if my question makes sense to you. Um, thank you for the, it, it does, and we will ask uh, Robin to respond. I suppose when we uh, uh, talk of the Jewish diaspora in particular, we're not talking about a homeland for a very uh, large number of uh, centuries, but we are uh, talking about it, obviously, in the context of Israel, if that can be any kind of comparison with the crisis you know, in Greece, in homeland. Uh, Robin, what do you think? Okay, I mean, I suppose, my obvious answer is we'll need a little bit more time in, to discuss what you mean by crisis. And, you know, there are crises and crises. You know, one, one is, you know, if it's war, destruction, holocaust, and so on, it's not good for anybody, I don't think. Um, if you're suggesting some kind of uh, crisis that precipitates innovation and um, movement, uh, a sense of resistance, a kind of um, a, a popular reaction that is more positive. I can see that, but I think we need to kind of specify a little bit about what, what, what you mean by this. Are, are you alluding particularly to the economic crisis of the 2008 period, perhaps, or to uh, another one? Um. I, I don't know of, um, if that, if with reference to the book, yes, that was uh, the crisis completely. But uh, my understanding was that uh, Fortini kind of uh, addressed this question of uh, crisis more more broadly. And uh, as you did suggest, you know, you can have different types of crisis and having different impacts on diasporic populations. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking about that in terms of like your typology and, for instance, the victim diaspora and and how this, the, the victimhood experience for the Jewish people and the victimhood narrative was so important for the Jewish, uh, uh, for the self-conception of the Jewish diaspora because of different tragic events. And I came to, um, to think of um, interesting difference with the Greek case once more, one of the historically more uh, important tragic moments in modern Greek history and Rene knows everything about that, uh, the um, conclusion of the Greek-Turkish war, which uh, resulted in you know, the dispersion of, among others, the fourth dispersion of um, Muslim and Christian populations from the newborn Turkish state and the uh, existing modern Greek state, uh, led to the opposite result, and which is quite interesting, it didn't lead to uh, diaspora dispersing, but led for the Greeks the, to the return of the diaspora or the return of this a population that used to have this transterritorial articulation. Uh, so it had the kind of, uh, you know, that's just uh, a kind of uh, accident of the history that for those two people, you know, you had tragic events having different effect in terms of what they did for dispersion or, or return. All right, if I could just have a, a brief moment then, Otan, uh, just to respond to that, because I think that's very helpful and helps me frame a more coherent uh, response to Fortelli, which is that, Absolutely, the one um, type of diaspora that uh, is clearly very important is the victim diaspora who has surmounted this a crisis. So the victim diaspora hood is very often alludes to the Jewish experience, the Irish experience, the African experience, the Palestinian experience, the Armenian experience. And of course, the, on the one hand, these experiences of victimhood of genocide, slavery, and 
uh, starvation in the case of the Irish, um, of, dis of forced dispersal in the case of the Palestinians, that can create a kind of air of demoralization and despondency. On the other hand, it is also the basis of a group mobilization because you have a very strong uh, historical narrative around which you can construct a group identity. And as we were alluding to in the earlier question about the success or otherwise of migrants in general and diasporas in particular, having a strong group identity can have very, very powerful positive consequences. So I hope that helps a bit. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, before I give the floor to Adrian, if I could just follow up uh, from uh, your understanding, is there a point, um, especially with the victim diasporas that have been, um, you know, moving as a result of crisis, basically, um, in the case of the Jewish diaspora, is that part also of the identity of the Jews that are living in Israel still? I mean, do they still feel that they are a diasporic population? Or does the fact that there was a created state kind of put a break into this kind of, uh, you know, of, of, of self-identification as diasporic population? Uh, it's a, that's a fascinating question. The, the Zionist movement argues very strongly that Israel or the success of Israel or the return to the homeland is the end of diaspora. So it's seen essentially as a kind of solution to what is described in very negative terms as, um, you know, the experience of Jews abroad is never secure, it's never um, guaranteed, there will always be anti-Semitism. So the return of uh, Jews to the, home, to the homeland or the ancient homeland, or the supposed ancient homeland, invented homeland, however you want to construct it, is seen as the solution. However, there are some interesting twists to this tale so, for example, there is now a really considerable number of Israelis who are moving from Israel, so to the United States, to Britain, to elsewhere, um, in pursuit of their own economic, um, you know, uh, interests and, and and so on. So, what does one describe them? And, and quite often they are uh, describing rather derogatory terms as yordim, as people who are going down rather than people who are going up, because people who are going to Israel were described as going to Aliyah, going up uh, to some sort of hallowed state. So they, this is a religious expression. And if you left Israel, you were seen as in some way traitorous. So this has become quite an interesting discussion. But of course, there's also this tension, which um, is quite strong between Israel and the diaspora, particularly since the big diasporic community in the United States, the younger people in there are much more prone to universal values. So they're much more prone, for example, to take human rights positions, pro-Palestinian positions, rather than simply and um, in an unreconstructed way say, well, Israel is right, uh, you know, whatever the circumstances. So there's quite a lot of tension building up between Israel and, and the diaspora. Thank you. Now, um, let's uh, uh, allow um, uh, Ladislav, please, uh, Adrian Chasty, to ask a question. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for this very interesting panel. Um, I'm asking this question as an Irish person. Uh, I, for me, when I when I think of diaspora, I, I weigh heavily the the concept of victimhood, this sort of sense of having having lost your country forever and having a lot of nostalgia for it. And I, I think that applies less and less to what we more and more call expatriate communities or, or global citizens, uh, because there's much more the sense that you can go back. So my question is for communities that are abroad but see themselves as only temporarily abroad. I'm, I, I, the example in my in my written question was the Greeks working in Dubai since the global financial crisis, and they're only there for a couple of years, and they go back to Greece uh, several times a year, perhaps. Are they the diaspora? Are they just expats, or are they actually 
Greeks who are very mobile. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, yeah, that's a complex uh, question. I think it points to a basic distinction in anthropology uh, between the emic and the etic uh, conceptualizations. A emic being uh, the ones by the subject were adding their own understanding of, of things and of their self, and etic being, you know, uh, the concepts and the understandings of the, of the analysis. So if we are to um, uh, develop um, a theory, um, a typology, a definition of diaspora, uh, which is you know very coherent, then we can uh, decide whether those temporary Greeks in uh, in uh, Middle East qualify or not as diasporans. And I think that uh, most of such kind of definitions would possibly exclude them because of what we we're describing before. Uh, as being particularly important in, you know, in the notion of diaspora being time. Uh, you need time to emerge and, and form a diaspora. And then you know, this idea of forming a collectivity and a sense of belonging to that collectivity. On the other hand, though, uh, and I do not exclude that there could be understandings and definitions of diaspora that could include them. But on the other hand, what is also equally important is when you ask people and see how they perceive themselves and whether they think, you know, diaspora is a term that uh, it uh, describes their experience and their identity. And it could be that those people, especially because they're in a country which is far away and they may have, you know, the nostalgic feelings or they may, you know, not, uh, they may have like a limited people or uh, number of Greek people, but they are strongly knit together. They, they may embrace the term. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting that in the survey that we did uh, here in the United States uh, in, the, in the context of the Greek Diaspora Project uh, here at CISOPS, we asked the question to people here in the UK where our survey focused. It focused on uh, uh, Greeks in the UK, and the majority of the people in that country are recent arrivals having come after uh, 2010 and as a result of the Greek crisis. Interestingly, a minority among them described as self-identified uh, um, as a di diasporans, but also an even smaller uh, minority uh, self-identified as, as uh, experts. They used the term um, uh, European citizen or citizen of the world, which is it's quite interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add in brief that I think it was René who raised the issue of transnationalism right. and transnational community. And I think in response to Adrian, I think it's perfectly uh, right to say that uh, you don't need to hang on to the di word diaspora as if it's some sort of treasure. Mm -hmm. If people are changing what they're doing, and particularly because they're much more mobile, um, it's much more possible to hop on a plane to Dubai and backwards and forwards. It's much more appropriate to think of them as transnational, as a transnational community or expatriate rather than members of the diasporic community, which implies some degree of continuous settlement and self-organization, uh, which I think is rarely found in expatriate communities. Um, Robin, uh, would you like to put your, your point here? Uh, you've got this example from the Hungarian um, uh, diaspora. Ladislav, would you allow Robin to, to make a point? Thank you. Thank you, Othon. If I'm allowed another go, um, I, uh, I put the question, uh, you may be able to see it, but uh, orally, what again interests me, and I quote it as an example, ex expat, to use a neutral term, Hungarians in London and Oxford. Um, I, I spoke to the Hungarian society in uh, Oxford last term, and um, many of them were students or researchers, not all. Um, and we had a fascinating discussion. I asked them in the end, do you conceive of yourselves as primarily Hungarian or as primarily uh, young professionals, which means in effect economic migrants. Um, now, many of them said they wouldn't go back to Hungary while Orban and his acolytes were in power. Um, but 
this led me to think, what is it? Is it the tie to the homeland? Is it search for a better life? And as an example of Scots going to America voluntarily, I'm not talking about the clearances, which was forced emigration, but voluntary economic migration. What is not so much written about is that actually some of them um, go back. So my question is really, um, and in particular in, in Manuel Lusses and Dothan's project, um, did you speak to any of those who were less successful and who, who went back either for economic reasons or because the ties of the homeland were stronger? Because what I'm interested in is, is it the cultural identity which has the stronger pull? Thank you, Robin. I think Manolis can have a couple of points to make uh, on this, uh, also following the survey that uh, we conducted. Yes, um, thank you. That's, uh, that's um, a very fundamental uh, question, and uh, I, I'm sure I, I wouldn't be able to answer it in its complexity. Uh, but sticking to the Greek case and the recent emigration of Greeks uh, as a result or in relation to the crisis, um, yes, we indeed try to identify um, uh, even though we, did, we haven't done like focused research on return migration, we were asking people whether they contemplate uh, returning or not. And uh, interestingly, the majority were not uh, planning to do so, at least in the short term. And that's related to the fact that, you know, the, the planning of the migration project was such that um, entailed you know, several years to uh, achieve the goals that they had set uh, from, from their migration uh, planning. And also it related to the, the condition in Greece, which they didn't, they saw as not having substantial exchange from the period uh, that uh, they left. When, when we speak about the longer term, then the majority, uh, something like two thirds, uh, plan to return at one point without specifying, you know, the, the time frame. Still, that one third that claimed that they will never want to return, I think that's particularly striking, and especially for the Greek case, which had historically kind of uh, migrants embrace this ethos of return. So even if they wouldn't return, eventually they would say that they would wish to. So I think this one third surprises me more than the two thirds that say that they won't want uh, to to return uh, eventually. And in terms of um, uh, Another striking uh, finding is that uh, uh, the people who are of um, who have less educational credentials come from uh, um, lower class uh, background families. What are the ones, interesting enough, even if we think that those would be the ones who would return because they would find it difficult, more difficult, but and that is the case generally, and that has been the case. When you ask them, they were the ones who more strongly wish to remain in, uh, in the UK. And I guess that's because, you know, it's much more difficult for them to engage in such kind of mobilities. So, and it's a much more, uh, and they have invested much more in that project. So it's not so easy for them to, to return back and, you know, start all over again. Whereas for the more upper class, let's say migrants, like moving back and forth and engaging in this transnational lifestyle, which could include like staying abroad for some time, returning and doing that again, it's much, much more easy. Uh, thank you, Manoli. Now, um, Adrian has uh, actually added um, an additional uh, parameter to her question. I think that um, uh, we should address to Robin because uh, she does say that uh, if more and more of us see ourselves as global citizens, will the concept of diaspora become anachronistic or its meaning evolve? I mean, you know, do you see a certain progress in how diaspora is, is involving uh, Robin? <laughs> that, you know, think of, of, of the present and future as well, right? Yes. Well, <laughs> I think it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, I, I wish I could answer in the affirmative and say, yes, 
That's all the cosmopolitans, and that's all the global citizens, and I hope that's the direction of change. But I think um, you have to be realistic and say that ethnicity and nationalism are still very powerful forces um, in the world, and they do carry a great deal of emotional weight and historical reference. And so it's quite difficult um, to imagine a world in which uh, global citizens are predominant, at least for the, for the, for the next time. I'm not closed uh, in my mind to that possibility. I would love that to happen, but I suspect it's going to be quite a while before it does. Um, thank you. And shall we bring uh, Charles Enoch now? Ladislav, would you like to allow Charles to get into the discussion? Charles, would you like to ask your question, make your point? Sorry, I had to press the unmute button. Um, can you hear me? Yes, thank yes, you for, well. for a very, very interesting discussion. Um, my, my question is, are there examples of the diasporas cooperating with each other? In that we've discussed, you know, you've discussed the Greeks and the, and, and the Jewish diasporas, and they happen to be in you know, the, the same sort of place in some time. I mean, in some places with a host community, one can imagine say in the Ottoman Empire, where there's maybe a religious binding between various diasporas, or in the United States, where there's a, you know, a, 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 an Anglo-Saxon majority. Are, are there examples really of where, where, you know, whether formal or informal, where you do actually have diasporas sort of coming together and, 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 and working together? Thank you. Uh, Robin, would you like to respond to this? What prompts diasporas to cooperate with each other? <laughs> Well, look, that's such a good question. I think I'm going to have to take it away and think about it even more than I, I can respond spontaneously. What I will say in partial answer is there's a lot of mutual learning from each other. And that has become almost um, uh, you know, a kind of a universal theme, uh, if you like. So that, for example, um, you get uh, the Indian diaspora, that's I'm saying, of course, I'm being, of course, from the Indian subcontinent in the United uh, in, in the United States, saying they wish to learn. Some people might not wish this lesson to be learned but from the Jewish diaspora in the United States. How do you lobby Congress? How do you raise money? How do you develop a philanthropic arm of your diaspora? And there's a lot of mutual learning in that respect. So. On the other hand, if you think of governments um, trying to reach out to their diasporas, I'm with the inverted commas around there, because this possessive pronoun isn't always appropriate, they wish to try and gather um, information, support, remittances, and all kinds of political um, uh, support from their diasporas abroad. And so they are learning from each other. And in fact, there's a little bit of a circuit of countries um, who teach each other how to connect with your diasporas. I'm occasionally asked to go to country A or country B and explain how this is to be done. I try to avoid this because I'm not clear that I wish to support certain states in their aspirations to uh, exploit or connect their diasporas. But I think the question I'd like to think about a little bit more, whether there's a sort of, if you like, a coalition of purpose in diaspora countries, in countries of settlement. I'm not sure whether you can think of an example, uh, Manolo. Um, can I, uh, Manolo, can I just uh, interfere here? Because we've got actually in, um, in our audience uh, a student from Greece that is doing uh, a uh, thesis, a PhD thesis, on how the Jewish and the Greek diasporas cooperate in the United States in terms of matters of foreign policy and how they kind of pull their resources together in order to have a better effect. That's one aspect of it. Yes. Manolis, I don't know whether you wanted to add something here. Thank you. Uh, can you, uh, Ladislav, allow um, Ioana Pepelasi, please. It's written in Greek characters to um, uh, ask a question. 
Hello, I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you, Joanna, very well. Congratulations for this initiative. And I would like to actually not ask a question, but make a comment that from um, our historical studies on the Greek diaspora in the Ottoman Empire and also in Russia and elsewhere, we see that the Greeks and the Jews in certain areas and the Armenians would collaborate. They wouldn't always be collaborators. So there's a long history of uh, diasporas uh, collaborating at certain points. And if we look at today, the big question in Greece in terms of the startup ecosystem, which is going to be the focus uh, both of the government and of entrepreneurship to bring Greece out of the crisis, there is a growing focus on diaspora and how to learn from the Jewish diaspora. Uh, how did Israel use its Jewish diaspora in order to become the startup nation? And we want to learn how we can use our Greek diaspora. And I'd like to say that I was, I just have been going in and out of another panel where they presented um, a, a current research, it just was circulated on the charting of the Greek startup ecosystem. And in this uh, webinar, there were people from the government and academics and stakeholders in the system. And I assure you for the first time, did I hear the word diaspora come in so many times into the conversation. Whereas as even a week ago or two weeks ago, I would hear about the VC funds and the capital angel investors and now the diaspora is being accepted as a, as a stakeholder that can play a very important role. I'm sorry I took a bit away from what you're talking about, but I was so happy listening to this, I wanted to transfer it to you. Uh, not at all, Johan. Actually, that was a, a great comment. Uh, probably Robin want, wants to um, address that as well. But it's, uh, yeah, but what it tells me basically is that uh, this is a term that becomes relevant also in other fields as well. It's not just about uh, cultural or identity related questions, but if that's something that goes into entrepreneurship as well, you know, purely economic matters, I mean, that says something about the validity of the term basically. No, indeed. No, I, I, I concur. I don't want to add anything to that other than to say it's become a, a term in intergovernmental discussion, in the World Bank, amongst governments, in policymakers. So it really has actually diffused very, very far from its, from its origins. And, um, you know, almost, if you like, to the point where it's losing a certain coherence. You can't really begin to... to to, you know, we started off with definitions and what's in the word, and I mean, the problem is the word has proliferated uh, to such a degree that one of the more cynical scholars has described the word as a diaspora diaspora. So it's, it's proliferated in its meaning uh, and dispersed. Uh, indeed, and I, I think we've been very uh, true to our title in that we started with the ancient times and we did bring the discussion to the present. I was myself thinking, how on earth are we going to do that? But it's been happening you know, so smoothly. I would like to ask the three of you whether you would like to make any final comments um, uh, maybe before we close. Uh, Rene, would you like to say something as a double diaspora citizen that you are? Well, thank you very much. Um, I feel even more overwhelmed by the fact that I'm not qualified to speak about this topic, except that Manoli pointed out there is an EMIC view, which is the insider's view, and I can possibly talk about that better than I could about the EPIC one. But I'm very grateful to the um, panel for um, bringing up so many very important is issues that have a bigger reverberation than what it looked like at the beginning. Thank you, Rene. Manolis? No, I, I think uh, <laughs> we have covered so many topics and uh, in a way with the uh, latest kind of uh, taking of the term to the present entrepreneurship, uh, <laughs> it's kind of we ended up where we were supposed to end according to the title that we assigned to this, so I don't want to ruin that. I just want to, to thank very much uh, Renee and, and Robin, it was a great honor for me to share the panel with uh, them. 
Yeah. And, 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 and last word. Last word is just to thank everybody who's organised this, and to thank Rene in particular for being such an effective chairman and Othan for hosting us in such a successful way and our technical support. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me also say as a final word uh, to uh, the audience, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to this. It's been a terrific uh, discussion and uh, we have actually enriched our understanding of uh, our diaspora project. I have to thank um, uh, Manolis for organizing this in terms of putting the panel together, Rene for um, accepting to chair this and um, connect the different uh, the views from one and the other side, and Robin in particular. I have to say, Robin, you were the first person that I came to when we started the Greek Diaspora Project. I will not forget that ever, because you gave such wise advice to me. I also want to thank you for um, uh, coming to this, and also congratulate you that your book, Global Diasporas, which is a must read for everybody that is doing diaspora studies. We just cannot do diaspora studies without reading this book. So, uh, and uh, Rene, uh, you also, um, this year with the anniversary and your book coming out as well. Thank you all three very, very much and the audience for attending this. I'm sorry, we'll have to cut this abruptly. We would have celebrated with a glass of wine, but we're going to do it in an anniversary year. Hopefully we can bring people in Oxford and we can have you uh, with us uh, uh, on site and live, but it was excellent to have the panel, I think, the way that they communicated with each other uh, as a panel on one screen and uh, exchanging with each other. Thank you very much, all of you, and thank you to the speakers. Bye-bye.